Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Such a treasure. My first time preaching. Yay. Um, but as soon as Pastor Steve asked me, the Lord, I woke up the next day, and it was like the unknown path. And I was like, oh, that's a little ominous. How about navigating the unknown path? That sounds a little more friendly. So, um, so I'm excited to share what the Lord has put on my heart. Um, but let's pray first. Father, I thank you for this opportunity tonight to share your word, Father. It is not I who speaks, but you, Holy Spirit. I invite you to speak through me, Lord. Use my mouth to touch and change hearts, Lord, to reveal the blinders and the blind spots that we have in our life, Lord, that we can follow you successfully down the path of this life that you have prepared for us, Lord. So I thank you for giving me your words tonight. I thank you for your anointing and your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, Monique always picks, the Holy Ghost does amazing with the songs that she does that always tie into the message. Honestly, when she sent me the list this week, I was like, oh, that's good, that's good. Oh, Oceans. Oh, I was like, I, I love that song. I've just heard it so many times. But then tonight we were singing it. I said, this ties in perfectly with my message. So praise God. He knows. He's so smart. So good job, Monique. Um, and thank you. I see some special faces in the crowd who don't normally come to church here, but thanks for coming to support me. So I just wanted to say that. Um, okay, so who here has any sort of goal or plan or desire of your heart? Anyone here have a goal? Yes, you all should have some sort of goal, whether that's to walk 10,000 steps a day or eat healthy or write a book. Maybe someone has to write a book. Maybe someone's like, I'm called to be a preacher, or I'm going to host a TV show, or I'm going to be a professor, right? We all have goals. Goals are good. And so tonight, I'm going to talk about the journey getting to that goal. And everyone should have got a handout. Did everyone get a handout? Because I like notes and taking notes. If I don't write something down or put it in my phone, it does not happen. So if you need a paper, raise your hand. And I think we have pens too. Um, because I have four points, four keys I'm going to share with you that are going to help you navigate this path, and uh, you can jot them down. And then when the Holy Ghost, like if I'm saying something and you're like, oh, it just kind of hits you, that's the Holy Ghost speaking to you, so write it down, and uh, it's going to be good. Any anyway, I love the little lighthouse thing. That's good. So navigating the unknown path. So we all have a goal, and... I had a desire of my heart, actually, come true this past year. That's a whole nother story. But I'm going to share with you what I learned and how that kind of tied into this message. So I was able to go to the Masters last year, which was incredible. Everything you can imagine, gorgeous, $1.50 pimento sandwiches, like just stunning. But what I didn't realize is that it is hilly. Like, I was like, oh, we're walking up there to the top of the ninth green? Wow. I thought, how do all these elderly, not elderly, how do you say, people older than me, how do they get up that hill without like a cane and a walker? I felt like I almost needed one to navigate this mountainous uh, golf course because here in Florida, golf courses are flat. I've been to the Honda Classic at PGA. I've been around. Golf courses are very flat here. But in other parts of the country, they're very mountainous. There's hills, all kinds of things. You don't know. And so I was there, and we're going to put some pictures up. Uh, go ahead. All right, anyway, so that's me, my friend Jenna, and my friend Allison. We're both Allisons. And that's the, like, clubhouse in the back. I think this is the, uh, this is the 18th T green. The green is where the hole is. The T is where you hit it, right? Okay, so on the right is the 18th green. That's where the tournament ends. Okay, you can go. Um, and then this is the 16th hole. So Jenna said, we're going to sit at the 16th hole. So we had our chairs and we walked in and we made a beeline for the 16th hole at the tee. Well, kind of a long, it's a long skinny, you tee off over this long skinny pond and then there's the green. So we sat kind of closer to the green, but along the side of this pond. And so that's the tee on the left there. You can see like that black area on the ground. That's where they tee off. And then they walk along the pond. Go ahead to the next one to the green on the right-hand side. And what I learned that day, or we'll just go one more. When, after they finished teeing off, now this, I was there on a practice round. So what's amazing about a practice round is, everyone, if you wanna be good at something, you have to practice, right? Okay, you can't just go do it your first time and knock it out of the park and get hole-in-ones every 18 holes. So this is a practice day. And when they, they can hit off the tee as many times as they want. So they're usually, they're in groups of three. I think that's like, 
Jordan, Justin Thomas, and I don't know, with some famous ones. So they, once they all hit, the caddy is walking around to go to the green. And as soon as they're done hitting, the crowd starts yelling, skip it, skip it. And the play, what they want to do is the players walk up to the edge of the pond and they all put a ball down and then they, everyone counts one, two, three. And they all hit the ball and they skip it across the top of the water to see if it'll go. And then it, some goes on the green, some fall down in the water, but like the crowd is going wild. It's very entertaining. Okay, next. So then they come, that's Tiger and Rory and Fred Couples in the back. Keep going. So then they walk around and then they go to this area where they spent like 10 minutes practicing. They hit the ball out of the sand trap. They go to the other sand trap, they hit it in. Because this, can you tell? See how the people are standing up behind? It's so hilly. There's hills and dips and valleys and they have to practice their putting from all these different areas. You can go to the next one. They have to practice their putting from all these different areas so that when they're competing in the tournament and they hit that ball, when it lands, they know which way it's going to roll and how fast and all this kind of stuff. They take notes. And what I also learned is that they move the, the, the hole, the T. No. The ball, what do they call it? The hole. <laughs> they move it every day. I thought the hole always stayed in the same place, but no, they move the hole every day. So you have to know, you have to study and know that green area like, because someone on the left, they, they hit it up and around. You would think they would just hit it on a straight line to the hole. But no, because the ground is all uneven and undulating. And so they, they hit it. It was crazy. We just sat there watching them. Next. I think that's my last one. They just were moving all over, practicing, keep going. Is that it? Okay. So I thought... It's kind of like our path in life, right? It's, it's a path. We have a goal, something that maybe God has given you, maybe just a basic goal. And maybe you don't have a goal. Maybe you're like, I don't know what God has called me to do. And kind of honestly, that's where my life purpose is. I wasn't given like, oh, you're going to do this or you're going to do that. Like I had this heavy specific revelation from the Lord. And that's okay because we have little goals. We have different things that God gives us. And as we're moving towards that, right, as we take a step each step becomes more clear. And so um, you are going to navigate successfully your path as we walk down this goal together. And it's all right if you don't know what that is. God will reveal it to you as you need to know it for like the big goal. Like I wasn't given, you're going to be a preacher. Like Abel, I think you've been prophesied over to be a preacher, right? Or a prophet. You don't know? You have. But anyway, <laughs> he's an engineer. That doesn't mean God doesn't have that in the plan, but there's goals and progress we take along the way. So next, please. Thank you. All right. So my verse, uh, I got two verses. The first one is Ephesians 2.10, which says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I was reading a different version uh, today at the end of that because it says God prepared in advance for us to do. Another version says he ordained that we should walk in them. And another version says he planned for us long ago. So kind of like Abel was talking, God knows the path and he has it laid out for us. It's up to us to follow him and find that path. And then another scripture uh, this is Luke quoting Isaiah. He was talking about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. It says in Luke 3, every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought down. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth. So I love that. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth. So think of that one goal or desire that you have, okay? You see that over there and you're here. Maybe you're halfway there. I don't know. <laughs> but you're here. And you see the goal. But you don't know the hills, the valleys, the celebrations, the oasises. You don't know the good things that are going to happen nor the bad things that are going to happen on your path. But guess who does? God. That's right. He knows. And so when you're thinking about that, our, our first thought is to... Do I not have a topic up there? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's different up there than it is when I have my notes that I've been reviewing. So there's a scripture that everyone talks about when you talk about a path or a journey as a Christian. We're always talking about running the race, right? It's a marathon. It's a race. We got we to gotta go. In uh, Hebrews 12, Paul wrote, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like running. I don't like races. When I think about a marathon or a race, I just... I just, the sweat, the anguish, like I don't run. This body does not run. I I love to walk. I'll walk fast, but racing is not my thing. Uh, when, because when they use it in this context, it's always like a marathon. And where's Julie? Is she in here? No, she's in Kids Church. Brian, are you in here? You're hiding. Brian runs like triathlons, okay? Iron Man stuff. I don't know how he does it. I... Don't even like to think about it. So we're taught, that's why we're talking about a path, okay? Yes, we're on a journey. It's a journey. It doesn't have to be necessarily always referred to as a race or a marathon. But again, on those, there's highs and there's lows. So off in the distance, if you see your goal way up there, I like to think of like Indiana Jones, right? He sees the temple, the treasure way over there, but he's got to navigate through the jungle and you never know what you're going to get. And so my keys are hopefully going to help you navigate that with confidence. Amen. Okay. So the first one is to, and this is kind of actually could be the only point I give you, and that is to know God intimately. He has the answer. He knows the path. He has laid out your life and he will reveal it to you. We have to get to know him though, for him to reveal that to us. If you don't spend time with someone, you don't know them. Julie Lyles in the kids' church that I just mentioned, she has, if she called me on the phone, pre-caller ID, like I didn't know it was her, and I said hello, and she just started saying, I can't believe who I just ran into, you won't guess. I will know it's her because I know her voice. She even has this little, ahem, ahem, cute little tickle thing that she does. So even if I picked up the phone and all I heard was, ahem, I would know it was Julie. That is how well I know her. That is how intimate we are as friends. And so you need to know God's voice and know God so well that like even when he doesn't speak, you just like, you know that feeling. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Amen? We want to know God intimately. And next, thank you. Um, My verses with that are James 4, 8, which I think you all should know, but it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Will God draw near to you just by himself? Yes, he's there, but he is a gentleman. He is not going to force himself on you and, hey, 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 I told you to do, hey, hey, Nadine, Nadine, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna do that. He wants us to pursue him. He wants us to draw near to him and he will draw near to us. And then the second verse uh, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, and again, the race thing, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us, so, or let us navigate the path God has set before us. And we do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So how do we keep our eyes on Jesus. We spend time with him. We read his word. We sing to him. We listen. We are just still. And that doesn't mean you necessarily always have to just, okay, timer's on for 10 minutes. I'm just going to sit here quietly. Speak God. I mean, that's good to do sometimes, but that's not always it. A lot of times when I'm reading my Bible, thoughts will just pop up about questions that I have or, you know, I've been praying about something. And as you're reading, something will come. That's why it's good to have a note and pen and paper when you're reading your Bible because... God will speak to you or God will give you a thought. And you're like, huh, that's weird. And then later that night or the next day, you'll be like, oh, that's why. But if, you, if I don't have it written down, I can't remember. I mean, we, that's why we have to take notes in school, people, right? It's proven that when you write something down, you remember it. So have a paper and pen when you're reading your Bible and write down just any thought. You might, you might think, oh, that's me, but write it down and see later. Is that, was that God or was that me? And then you'll, that's how you become familiar with his voice, Okay. God speaks to me weirdly through TV shows, movies, podcasts. Um, What was the first one? Oh, yeah, TV show. Uh, There was a, I turned on my TV and I never watch uh, like science, science shows, Animal Planet. And I live by myself. No one uses my TV. And I turned on the TV and it was like seahorses 
and dad, you'll get a kick out of this. I don't think I've told you it. I was like, what am I supposed to do, Lord? What am I supposed to do? Just been like a year or two of praying this. And there's these sea dragons and the announcer is, is saying, even though the sea dragons were well cared for by their father, it is now time for them to find their own way in the world. And I, it was just like, whoosh. I was like, oh, okay, okay, God. All right, I got it, I got it. I mean, I literally turned on the TV and that was the first thing that comes out. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess it's time for me to find my own way in the world. All right, I got it. Because apparently the sea dragons, the, the fathers take care of them, kind of like the penguins in Antarctica. But anyway, so that's my first point. Prioritize spending time, get to know God intimately. I mean, that, again, I could wrap up on that. But spend time with God. He wants to talk to you. He is always talking always talking. But the question is, are we listening? That's the problem. <laughs> We're not listening. We need to spend time and listen. He's always talking. He wants, he's, he's like your father or your mother, or whoever loved you. They want to spend time with you. They want to help you, but you need to listen. Amen. Okay. So number two, you must believe that you're worthy to get that goal or that prize or that desire that God has given you or that's on your heart. If you don't believe that you're not worthy of that or that that can happen for you, guess what? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. No matter how much God gave me that word, yep, but I can't do that. I don't know enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not friendly and you know, whatever. The devil will give you a million excuses you have to believe that you can do that. And why? Because you're so great? No, because you have Jesus living on the inside of you, hopefully. And you have to know, it says in Galatians 3.26, for you are sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. If you've asked Jesus into your heart and he's your Lord and Savior, then you have a right to believe all the things the Bible says about you and to do what the Bible says you can do. It's not because of who you are, but it's because of Jesus. Not because of you, because of Jesus. You just have to, you know, there's that thing. If your great uncle died and left you a million dollars, it's just sitting in the bank. You, if you don't know who you are and go claim that, that's out there, but you can't use it. You have to Go claim your birthright. And in Galatians 2.20, it says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, you are nothing special. I am nothing special. He is. He is. And we just had that eclipse on Monday, right? The solar eclipse where the moon, I would love to have been in the path of totality to like have it become dark in the middle of the day. That's a goal. Although in 2045, I think it's coming right over Florida, but how many years is that? 20? Okay, yeah, I'll still be here, yes. Um, but the moon is dark. When that moon went in front of the sun, everyone could look up at the sun because it was blocked by the moon. Was the moon giving off any light? No, the moon is just a ball of rock. And the sun is what is the gaseous star that's burning and gives off the fire. If the moon, for the eclipse, if the moon did not have the sun shining on it at night, would we see it? No, we don't see it. We only see it when it can reflect. Right now it's a little sliver because the earth is blocking part of the sun. And that's why it's that little thumbnail or whatever you want to call it, the sliver. The moon is nothing without the sun shining on it, and we are nothing without Jesus. Amen? So how do you know who you are in Christ? You're going to read the scriptures, and you're going to find what it says about who you are, especially if you're in a particular situation. Maybe you need um, help in your relationships, or maybe you need help with something at work, or maybe you need help with a community or a program that you're involved in. You, you can find, there are scriptures in the Bible about different topics. It's amazing. I mean, I found a scripture about believing for a husband in Isaiah. Who knew it was there? <laughs> I was fasting and praying, and when my fast was over, bam, there was this scripture. So I guarantee whatever kind of situation you're in, there will be a word that God will give you in the Bible that will um, just come alive, and you can stand on that as a promise. But anyway, a couple scriptures I want to read for you as an example of who you are in Christ. Google, 
Who am I in Christ? And I guarantee there will be websites that will pop up with tons of scriptures to get you started. But Mark 16, verses 17 and 18 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. So repeat after me, say, I have received the power of the Holy Spirit, and he can do miraculous things through me. Like, see, if you don't believe that, is it going to happen? No, but you, you have to believe that. That's why we have to read the word and come to church and read the word, because the devil in our flesh is like, no, you can't, you're not. You're not, you're not, but God says you are, you are, you are through me. So that's why we need to read the word. And then in Luke uh, 10 verses 17 through 19, it says, and Jesus had sent out, he had the 12 disciples, but then he sent out 72 more in pairs and the 72 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That means nothing physically, nothing spiritually, nothing mentally, nothing, right? But if you don't know that you have that power over that, the devil can play with you. But if you do, you can stand against it. So say, I have authority and power over the enemy. So these are the type of things, depending on what season you're in, write, find different scriptures, write them down, put them in first person, and confess them. So the, again, my first key was get to know God intimately. My second key was, oh yeah, believe, believe yourself. Sorry, the third one popped up there. <laughs> believe that you can do it, not because of you, but because of Christ. Believe in yourself. Know who you are in Christ, okay? The third key is ask for wisdom, You have access to the mind of Christ, to the Holy Spirit, to the God of the creator of the heaven and earth. Amazing. Look at all the talented musicians and movies and songs. I'm amazed that a new song comes out all the time. It's a new tune. It's a new lyric. Like the creativity, there's an endless supply of it. And we can tap into that. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says, we have the mind of Christ. Say, I have the mind of Christ. If the world can be that creative, as Christians, we should be even more creative. We should have even greater movies and shows and music and all that kind of stuff. Um, But King Solomon, he was the son of King David, right? King David was an important, impressive dude in the Bible. I mean, even people who aren't Christians probably know David and Goliath, right? Everybody knows that story. And Solomon now is coming to rule and reign the children of Israel after his father had passed away. And David had wanted to build the temple for the Lord, but God had said, no, you killed too many people, too much blood. I don't want you to build the temple. So David prepared. He gathered all the riches, all the wood, all the jewels, everything, all the money, and prepared it for one of his children to do it. And so then when Solomon became king, he had a tough act to follow. Can you imagine David, King David? Everyone knows David, and here Solomon is like, okay, I'm next, hi. <laughs> so he, he had a lot to overcome. And so he's, he's stepping in, they built the temple, and in 1 Kings, there are quite a few scriptures here, but it's worth it, trust me. So Solomon loved the Lord and followed all of the decrees of his father David, except that Solomon too offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. The most important of these places was at Gibeon. So the king went there and he sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings. And they did a lot of work with that stuff. They had to cut it and drain it, all kinds of stuff. So a thousand. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, you showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on the throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. 
And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I may govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong for who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours. I mean, I think we could say that about certain things in our lives. Lord, give me the knowledge to govern my family or my business or my friends or this, uh, you know, sport. Maybe you're young and you play sports or you've got a group of friends. I need your wisdom to help me do this. I cannot do it on my own. I feel like a child. We can all say that. And so uh, then 15, it goes, oh no, sorry. Then the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or will ever have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. And then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. So Solomon did not go to college. He didn't, uh, okay, I'm king now. I'm going to go off to university and study so that I can get wisdom to rule the people. No. Where did he get all this divine wisdom and revelation? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, yes. The same as you. He was no greater than you. He was just a man calling on the Lord for wisdom to help with the situation in his life, okay? You are in that same situation. If you need help in any area, call on the Lord, ask him for wisdom. He will give it to you. He wants to give it to you, okay? So first, we're getting to know God intimately. We are believing in ourselves, valuing ourselves that we can do what God has called us to do, who we are in Christ. Number three, we are asking for wisdom. That's right. And then the fourth thing that I love is you have to find community. You need to find people that can celebrate the good things in life with you when you're on that journey. Hey, it's a party. Hey, it's an oasis. Hey, fun times, vacation, right? You need people that can celebrate the good times with you, and you need people that can be there in the bad times, when you hit a wall, when you fall in that sand trap, when you, you know, bad things happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, last night I was at a funeral for an 11-year-old, and that was, whew. But that com there was community around that family. It was standing room only, packed out in the foyer outside. That community had come together to help this family in this time of need. And this is a long journey. And so we need community with us. We need community that can help us, um, encourage us to stand with us, to rejoice with us, to cry with us, to encourage us. We were not meant to do life alone. We're called the body of Christ. Everyone say body. Body. Are, you know, if I didn't have my thumb, we're all parts of the body, it would be hard to pick things up. I would, I would have to hold it like this if I didn't have my thumb, right? Okay. It's hard to do things when you don't have the proper tools. And God designed the body so that we can operate perfectly. And that's why he also designed the body of Christ, because we're meant to work together as a team to help one another, to encourage one another. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Sometimes we can hear things better from friends than we even can from our own family. Didn't you ever think that was funny? Like you have all these brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and parents, but yet when you hear advice from them, you're like, Ugh. I don't know. Maybe you're just mad because you don't want them to be right because you know that they've messed up in the past. I don't know. It's weird. But if you hear something from a friend, it can usually pierce and make a little more effort. I'm not sure why that is, but that's what the Bible says. It says a friend stick as closer than a brother, actually, in another scripture. So find community. And that can be in any phase of life that you're in. Maybe you're a mom with little kids and you don't, you don't have any other friends or moms to play with. Maybe you're you know, maybe you're a, a friend and you don't have a lot of friend circle. Find a club. Join groups with similar interests. There's all kinds of things you can do. Even um, 
online now. We have the virtual world. Before, you were just kind of stuck to your town and your area. But now you can join groups online. I mean, I'm in a mastermind based out of North Carolina, but we meet once a month, Mondays at 7 o'clock, on Zoom. And there's, you know, people from there and in California. And it's amazing. It's a great community. I'm growing. I'm learning. I'm being blessed. Hopefully, I'm blessing others in that group. But it was made through virtual. And so... Whatever phase you're in, maybe it's family. Maybe you want to do things together as a family. You need to go join a putt-putt league with your kids. I don't know. But God knows, and he knows what you're struggling with, where you need encouragement, and you have to reach out. Now, that might not be easy for some of you. Maybe you like being alone, and you don't have a lot of friends, and that's okay. But sometimes we all get discouraged. Sometimes we need someone to support us and say, hey, and that is also why we have the the church, the body, because you come here and you make friends and there are believers that can pray with you and encourage you when when you're struggling and going through something. I think also probably because I'm single is why I also love community. Because if you're married and you have a spouse, I mean, that's kind of half the battle right there. You have someone. But I love, I mean, I have a big family, which I love, but I, I need community. I need people specifically in different areas that I want to grow in or that I'm struggling in to help me. And God has provided that. Like, I didn't know I needed that. Five, 10 years ago, I wasn't at this point of my life. But now, in the past two years, God has just opened up community and people. There's a girl in Louisiana that I met who's been like a mentor to me in California. Um, in, In this past summer, I reconnected with a girl in Switzerland who I had known almost 30 years ago. And God just brought her into my life. We're in the same season. And it's God knows, God knows the desires of your heart. God knows the things that you're struggling with and dealing with. And he wants to bring people alongside of you. That's another way that God speaks to you, not only through his word and TV shows, but through people. He speaks to you through people. And so that's, that's a whole other reason to be around people who can support you and speak into you because God can use that. God can speak through people. Um, Okay, so just to recap, right? We're going to say, I'm going to get to know God intimately. I'm going to remind myself who I am in Christ. I'm going to ask for wisdom. And I'm going to find community. Be faithful in these things. Let's not be quitters. Let's run that I'm going to use the bad reference. Let's run that race, that marathon, and not give up. We know the destination. We know the prize is down that way. And we just have to keep going. We have to keep going. God is going to enable us to do that. Um, And your path may be different and unique from everybody around you. That's another reason to find community. My path is very different from most everyone I know. And, but that's okay. God knows. God knows my path. God laid it out before I was born. God knows your path. God laid it out. He has the answers for you. He has the people to help you. He has the answers to the obstacles you face, but you just have to keep going. You could go through seasons where you're frustrated or I've been on this journey for 20 years and I haven't gotten there yet, right? (laughs) Oh, well, just keep going. Let's not be like the Israelites who see this amazing Abel. I love how God just ties everything together. They come out of Egypt with the spoils, all the riches. God had the Egyptians give them all their treasure. I mean, can you imagine? They've been slaves for 300, 400 years, and now they're leaving in one night, and all the Egyptians give them all their treasure. So cool. And then they get to the Red Sea. Moses lifts up his arms. It parts. They go walking on dry land with water and fish staring at them on the sides. And they get to the other side, and then they watch it crumble down on top of the Egyptian army. I mean, talk about miraculous with your own eyes. And then, I don't know, how long later? A month? A week? Moses goes up on Mount Sinai for 40 days to get the Ten Commandments. And they're like, we need a God. Build us a golden calf. Moses is gone. Let's, let's, build, let's worship this calf. After they had just seen all that, I mean, come on, people. Let's, we can do it, all right? You have got the Holy Ghost living inside of you. They did not. You have Jesus and you have, if you have Jesus, you have the Holy Ghost. And so you can move forward in that. So I just wanna encourage you to write down just one thing. If you have that goal in each of these areas, whether it's 
Um, spending time with God, maybe you can wake up 15 minutes earlier every day or go on a walk if your house is noise and people. Go on a walk and pray. Can you um, write down, find scriptures, find th- one scripture that has to do with the situation you're facing so that you can know who you are in Christ in that situation? To get wisdom, is there a book you can read? Is there a mentor you can go find or talk to? And a mom that has a bunch of little kids that can relate with you, or maybe there's a you know a teacher at school that can help you with the situation you're facing with friends or people, um, or join a community online. Invite people over. I know it's uncomfortable sometimes to make friends or to make community. It's a little awkward for a lot of us to go say hi. But like I said last week, what did I say? The friendly people, people who were not necessarily popular, but people who were welcoming, they smiled at people. Just smiling gives someone the invitation that you are going to accept them if they say hi back or whatever. So just, just step out of your comfort zone. Make some friends. Find that community. Invite people over for a game night or invite people over for dinner. Try and build that community, and I guarantee God will bring you the right people. He's done that in my life. I'm amazed at the wonderful friends and connections he has given. I'm blown away. I think there's so many people in this world, billions of people, and everywhere I go, I make amazing friends who speak into me and who are for that specific need, and I am no one special. God will do that same thing for you, but are you asking him? God needs you to ask him. It's a two-way street. He's drawn near to you. You draw near to him. He'll draw near to you. He said, ask, seek, knock. If you want to, if you need friends, if you want that community, ask him for it. And then you got to step out and do a little bit, be uncomfortable for a little bit. So anyway, just write down something. That's what I, that's what I encourage you to do because God will reveal as you ask him. 